and welcome to our final lecture in this series. To begin with, before we get into the substance of it, I want to thank whoever it was who supplied me with the following slide so you can see the actual world versus the real world and some comparisons that exist out there. Um, I thank whoever thought that there is a certain flattering uh, resemblance between me and Mr. Lucas, but I must admit that his pay grade is far greater than mine. So, thank you for coming anyway. It brings up a point that we can begin with here, though, and that is the whole change that has affected the image making at the end of the 20th century and even into this century, uh, because it's going to have a profound impact upon what we see, how we see, and especially how it affects you and the others around you, the people who actually look at imagery. For example, of course, we can go back all the way to the 19th century and Van Gogh and his uh, famous painting of his bedroom, which has, in digital terms and times now, been mimicked and attempted to be copied. You can see one modernist example of that and uh, see how far it succeeds and, especially in my opinion, doesn't succeed, but you can compare it with the original and see. I would say, however far along digital imagery goes, never deny yourself the fact that you can always go back and look at the original. That's the best place to begin and probably the best place to end in any analysis with imagery. I wanted you to consider that because we're meeting that area right now where all these things are melding, where the classical art is being combined with the digital age in some very different ways and some very different manners. Call this era one of convergences and variations because that is largely what's happening here. Art forms, art genres are coming together, technologies are changing rapidly, and things are being built upon other things. And you have all sorts of various techniques, various schools, various disciplines affecting all this. Uh, certainly most profoundly, of course, with this new digital era, but even, even the beginnings before that. What I do is start you a little bit before that era so you can see what's there. In the 1960s, a gentleman tried to chart out all the movements in the growth of history of photography and did this thing called the whole photography chart. And by and large, it is mostly, well, the profound effect of it is confusing. Uh, so I suggest very strongly that, you know, if you ever get a chance to look at it, please do, but it is something that is very hard to follow because everybody affects everybody else in different ways and probably with new venues now in the last part of the 20th century as well. More to the point for me, I think this last part of the centuries is uh, one that is perfected by two images. One in the 1960s, probably most famous and most familiar to you, Dallas, Texas, November 22, 1963. The work of a amateur movie man, actually a tailor, uh, who was standing at the route in which President Kennedy was crossing Dealey Plaza when the shots of Lee Harvey Oswald opened fire. This image comes from Abraham Zapruder's motion pictures of that day, moments after the incident, and it is of course one that is etched in your memory because you've seen it many times taken not with a still camera, but with a motion picture camera. The other one dates from 2001, an image that popped up on the web about two days after the disaster, and that caused profound reaction at the time, because for all intents and purposes, it seemed to be a tourist standing atop one of the World Trade Centers moments before the plane hit. When this image came out, members of the press and other concerned professionals were up and about saying, is this real, is this not? And they were getting in touch with all sorts of editors and curators, all of us in the profession, calling us up and saying, what do you think of this? Is this a real image? Because it was supposedly pulled from a camera which was found in the wake of the destruction at 9-11. It's not. It's a lie and it's a lie that was very carefully crafted. But there are a whole number of reasons why not, 
uh, from the date stamp at the bottom of the picture to the fact that the angle of the sun is wrong. It's taken at the wrong time of day. It's taken from the wrong direction of the plane coming in and hitting the first tower. The plane's height is even too low or too high depending on how the dynamics of the measurements have gone. So it was a fraud. But it became sort of 9-11 man. And it entered a whole mythological level. And people, after a while, grew to react to the tragedy with a bit of wit about it as well. Understandably so. 9-11 man took on his own life in the course of that work. And he's appeared at such disasters now as the Hindenburg explosion in 1937. Or the sinking of the Titanic in 1912 or the attack of King Kong on New York City, or the attack of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man on the Twin Towers. All these sort of things have generated from that image, all based on a fiction, based on a tragic fact. And that's the way imagery has evolved in this century. We ended last time with the mention of Robert Frank and his pioneering work in America in the 1950s, resulting in his classic book, The Americans. It brought us a new level of documentation, a new level of reality to how we saw photography affecting us in terms of recording our own culture in this country by an outsider, because Frank again was Swiss. But it's a critical dimension of how photography was changing things. We were evolving towards what one exhibitor called a social landscape, and even adopted that name for a famous 1966 exhibition. Actually, there were two exhibitions that came along in that year that had importance. Twelve photographers of the American social landscape done at Brandeis University, and towards the social landscape done at Eastman House. They were interesting because they were building not upon trying to just record what was there, but to change the way we were seeing it, too. These, despite the title, they weren't interested in social reform. Photography was a valid picture-making system, not some socio-psychological challenge to just record what is there. As one of the famous photographers of that group said, Gary Winogrand, I photographed to find out what the world looks like photographed. The three photographers involved in the social landscape Deanne Arbus, Lee Friedlander, and Gary Winogrand were all practicing professionals at the time that the curator, John Sorkowski, pulled out and put into this MoMA show in 66. Arbus's work was very real, very straightforward, but had all sorts of archetypes and all sorts of characters within it. Friedlander's was almost mundane, almost commonplace. The world as it appeared to anybody who might have a snapshot camera, and yet they were carefully constructed, carefully designed imagery. And Winogrand, of course, went for irony, went for the glance, went for the moment that you saw in passing, and all things come together in that time and make that sort of statement about what's there. This, by the way, is Winogrand's photograph of a UT football game, the way he saw it when he was teaching here back in the 70s and 80s. In a sense, it was adopted from a term that Sarkowski used called born whole. A sense, as he put it, to abandon its allegiance to traditional pictorial standards, what we usually saw, and to be inventive in terms of traditional qualities. Photography was something that was no longer just documenting. It was seeing the world in a whole way. And the goal became to make the photograph seamlessly persuasive, he said, not just factually impeccable. In fact, he came up at the end with the dynamic and very hard to adapt to sentence from many, many photographers at the time, that most issues of importance cannot be photographed, that everyday things happen for which there is not a camera there and are just important. The work ranged from still life to constructed elements and imagery to whole fabrications of worlds which were meant not to be a literal interpretation, but rather a symbological one. And that was a complex issue for a lot of photographers raised in the real way of photography at the time. 
Another factor that occurred at this time was the fact that photography was becoming celebrated and used by institutions. MoMA put together the first Department of Photography in 1937, the George Eastman House a decade later. An actual group of people involved in education, the Society for Photographic Education, came along in 63. And universities, undergraduate and graduate departments, began to evolve degree programs in art and art and communication based on photography. And finally, and perhaps most influential, was the fact that a whole art market evolved. The fact that photographers no longer had to scrabble for a living if they were serious artists. They could actually charge work, charge prices, and actually the early predecessors of photography had a monetary value as well. And that monetization of photography began to establish it as something more serious. Well, at the same time this is going on, there are whole influences in art. And you're going to see that artists that had personal expression were no longer limited to a specific media. Genres did appear, certainly. Abstract expressionism we touched upon last time. Pop art, photorealist work, mixed media. All these things began to evolve. You see it in the abstract expressionist work, and you see it evolve into something called postmodernism. That emerged in the late 60s and the 70s. In one sense, it's continued on to this day. Pop art reintroduced imagery of mass media, of commerce, of popular culture. Photorealism almost looked like it took a step back. People were trying to make paintings that actually looked like photos. There was a whole emphasis on minimalism. Instead of making something complex, or something that's got collage, or something that's got many pieces, Let's pare it down to its basic elemental design forms. What's it like with one or two colors or a plain easel? And finally, there's a whole creation of modernism at the end of this tether, which is what Hilton Kramer called it, something that was changing inherently within the medium itself. If you look at some examples, you can see how this sort of representation is being altered how the abstract expressionism is adopting itself into the pop culture of the day. So that you will see it. Sometimes it's very straightforward, but sometimes it becomes more complex. Look at somebody like Andy Warhol, who was interested in personality and celebrity, not as a record of what that is, but as a record of how he could transform it, how he could change its look and still celebrate that almost mundane quality of something as glamorous as movie starlets and famous personalities. The photorealists, on the other hand, and this, by the way, is not a photograph, it is a painting, focused upon the everyday in the work and how a painting could come to look like a photograph or a street snapshot and still have a profound impact when you saw it on the wall. The minimalists that occurred at the time adopted bright colors or darker palettes that had very little contrast within them or had sharp basic patterns. Things that were complex, not on the basis of many elements, but on the basis of the contrast that was there with just a few elements. The neo-expressionism that came along in the 70s and continued throughout the century, essentially took that reaction to minimalism, minimalism and to conceptual art, and it began to portray the recognizable, but not in a straightforward manner. Things became rough, violently emotional. Some people called it anti-intellectual. You could recognize certain patterns there, but it was not there. Art was not just something pretty from Valentine. Portraits were simp not simple statements of what a person looked like, but what the artist felt a person would look like. 